Queen Charlotte and her husband, you know, George III, they are the most important people within this aristocratic world because all of the structure of the society that we see, this titled, rich, wealthy world, is organised around the royal family being at the top of it. That is how the whole institution of this London season and the courts operates. There's a playfulness to, to our court of Queen Charlotte, I think, which is, um, is really sort of fun and interesting, but it's rooted in an idea of, of the real royal authority that, that organises this world that we see. Historically, Anne the Bridgerton Queen Charlotte definitely have, um, uh, and there has to be a slight uniting element to that. Uh, both, I would say, are very, very important. And that's something that I've carried into the Bridgerton Queen Charlotte. <laughs> I love how human the Queen is in this. Like you, you feel so separate from the Queen, right? Like in our culture, like I feel like very distanced from the royal family. I love how the how connected it all seems and how human she is with her amazing attitude and quick wit. The interaction between Anthony and the Queen, top and tail, and bookend the season. She's very keen on the idea of him looking for a wife and when she announce, announces Edwina as the diamond of the season, she sort of gives him permission to, to, to start that love story, really. Basically, the whole world sort of revolves around the Queen's authority and permission. When it gets complicated for the Bridgerton family, um, you know, he's sent in to the, the dragon's lair and he has to go to, to Buckingham Palace and to, to meet her and to have a conversation with her. And I think she's terrifying. But with his privilege, I think he's probably known her all his life. And so there's a familiarity there and there's a kindness and a fondness that I think all the, all the boys and all the Bridgertons seem to um, be able to take advantage of. I think when you look at the court of Queen Charlotte, you have to look at a woman that was dealing with a lot of very difficult things in her own life and someone who, she was more in charge than her husband was, of course but also in a way more in charge than her son was because she very much understood how things worked. And I think her escape from all that stress was probably frivolity. And I think people can undervalue frivolity, like the way people say about, you know, reality TV, you go, well, that's just trash. And you go, yeah, but you know, the world's very stressful. So we need that kind of stuff. And I feel like that that that's her very much in my mind. And, you know, I think, you know, she's probably quite unhappy because she's got, so much to contend with and also then someone like Whistledown coming in, that has to be deeply annoying to her. The character comes out as someone who really isn't okay with what kind of goes with the title. I think she loves living that title, um, but I think she really surrounds herself uh, with people who will bring out sort of other elements to her to entertain her in a lot of ways uh, and challenge her in a lot of ways. So she obsesses with, you know, picking the diamond of the season, but. All these things, I think, are, are wonderful distractions in what could be uh, perceived as a very lonely world in existence. She's got this sort of buffer between her and the court, and I think it's not an accident that she has that. Obviously, for our dramatic purposes, it looks fabulous. Lady Danbury is um, part of her buffer. You know, she'll be the sharp-tongued part of her buffer, but she is part of her buffer. She'll also be the one that will sort of go, and now I'm going to slightly admonish you because you are the queen, but hey, we've been in this game a long time now, so you might want to reflect on that. Or maybe you won't, and I'll go and hide in a cupboard. She doesn't have a Pomeranian, but she is part of the buffer. Okay, four eight eight. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who is close to her and in her circle when you are in, you are treated with the utmost respect. You cross her, that's a different story, you know? So there's a real loyalty 
trust, openness, but you cross it at your peril. She always comes with her team, her entourage. There's always the group of ladies in waiting who are there waiting, <laughs> waiting for uh, something to happen or for them to be asked to do something or for her to need something. The, the term ladies in waiting does mean you are a lady in waiting, waiting to help in some way. And then we have to imagine that, you know, when we're at court, there is another world of people behind those doors, the people who open and close the doors, who fetch and carry, who make the fireplaces, who take the messages, who make sure that only the right people come into the palace building, that, you know, the royal court is run efficiently and effectively. Brimsley is like the main cat in the whole, you know, court. Well, he's described as the Queen's secretary or servant, but he's basically her eyes and ears because she can't go anywhere because everyone knows who she is. There was a, a lovely description in, in the stage direction which said that Brimsley lives for the goss, uh, which she also does. And his job is to find out what's happening. Plus, she is, because her husband's not well, she's sort of the monarch and is under enormous pressure. So it's his job to sort of make her life easier. But I think Brimsley is everything to her. A punching bag, a loyal, loyal friend, a deep, deep confidant. I mean, I always suspect he reads Whistle Down before he hands it to her, because she's a woman of mood swings, understandably. But he's trying to, it's almost like handing her exam results every morning. Is she going to be in a good mood or a bad mood? I think she's she needs somebody like Brimsley to just go, for fuck's sakes, can we? Or cry, or, you know, tell him to fuck off on occasion, do you know what I mean? Bless him. <laughs> you know, she puts him through his paces. They have a very similar sense of humour and taste, and they have that kind of simpatico relationship, which is not just about a monarch and a servant or an employer and employee. They really get on. She has a tough life. What we see is the lighter elements of her existence, which are the parties and the balls and the gossip and the fun. What I love about it is that it's quite often you see how bored she is because she's a really bright woman. You know, and like women of that time, they, they couldn't become politicians. They couldn't become prime ministers. So she's sort of having to do it sort of through her status of a monarch, her relationship with her husband. But what's fascinating is that she is equally as frightened of whistle down as everyone else is, so she, it humanizes her. Really big reactions to this one, lots of clapping, lots of excitement, cheers. <laughs> I'm rather lucky because all the servants, or we're all in the same costume throughout the whole season. She changes frocks as soon as she turns a corner. So you know that the purple thing near her is, is, is me. I think it's the most beautiful piece of costume I've ever had to wear. And you just kind of, it gives you your character. It straightens your back along with the heels. Um, I, I didn't realize until this job of what women went through, to be honest. You just go, by the end of the day, you just think, Christ. Every time I have a scene with Golder, it's like going into Santa's Grotto because she'll have a different wig and a different costume. And you just go, this is so clever. She's like constantly changing and I'm always consistent. The Court of Queen Charlotte obviously is, it's, it's like a theatre. It's something that she puts on for her ton to just show how rich, how famous, how influential she is. This is like she is what the modern world diva is. 
Well, Golda and I have got this standing joke because every time I put a wig on her, I'm like, oh my God, this is my favorite. And she just can't stop laughing because it's like, you say it every time. I need to film it next time. <laughs> so Queen Charlotte is an absolute joy to design for. I can't lie. I have so much fun with, um, with all the embellishment. And I've really wanted to kind of push this season with different embroideries, different techniques of, of her decoration. What's great is we put her in palaces that existed. So, you know, she would have gone to Hampton Court Palace, which we use for filming a lot. We know she was at Wilton House. There's records of her and George going to Wilton House, uh, which we use also a lot. So when it comes to the Queen, we sort of go, okay, so what's really out there? We haven't built any of the Queen's world. It's existing places. And it's always fun when we're doing our research to see whether she'd actually ever been there. Um, and more often than not, she has been. I know this character very well. When I went up for it, I think it was one of the easiest things that I've auditioned for. And I think as actors, when you get a part that you know, that you don't even have to think about, it comes from personal experience. It comes from um, journeys that you know, people that you know, you know. Queen Charlotte is very rooted in my mother and that side of my family. I'm a biracial human being. My father was black from South America. My mother was white from English, from England. We moved here. I was brought up white. You know, I hold my hands up. That's that's how I was brought up visiting uh, manic, you know, houses like this. So I know that horse, you know, that kind of afternoon teas and uh, English countryside and horse riding and you know, hockey and all, all of that kind of stuff. That's how I was brought up. So when Queen Charlotte came along, I did, it, it was it was there. It was there to grab hold of. So I, I sit <laughs> quite comfortably, I sit quite comfortably in these gardens of Hampton Court. This is where I belong. Queen Charlotte is just my favorite. I. Every time I got to work with Golda, it was just like one of my favorite days. I did like the times when it was just her and uh, Adjua, Lady Danbury. Uh, there were a couple of great scenes between the two of them and you felt that people kind of fell away and the two of them had their moment. And if they didn't fall away, they walked away. <laughs> I mean, I don't play the queen and I'm not Golda, but I suppose when I watch her and when I watched season one, it felt like she was holding it together really artfully as well, like in a really like, sort of beautiful, sort of painful way. Yeah, she was a pretty badass person. I couldn't think of anyone to pay her better than Golda. Okay, let's do checks to shoot then, please. 